In 2011, I started diving in kelp forests of the Monterey Bay and also started taking courses for my marine biology degree. In the classroom, I learned about sea urchins, kelp, rockfish, sunflower stars that made up a healthy kelp forest ecosystem. And then I would go diving and see those organisms with my own eyes underwater. I fell in love with the kelp forest. I didn't mind the poor visibility, I didn't mind the thick wetsuit, and I learned to embrace the cold. It was all worth it for the feeling of flying through an underwater forest, fully immersing myself in an ecosystem. But the water was cold. <laughs> Immediate ice cream headaches piercing my brain as I submerged into the murky waters. But I told myself I wasn't allowed to be cold in my seven millimeter wetsuit unless it was below 52 degrees, an arbitrary number that I still hold on to today. <laughs> Wool socks, a wetsuit, and a full bladder also helped me through, my, through those dives. <laughs> Little did I know, however, this ecosystem that I grew so familiar with was about to change. Beginning in 2013, sea star wasting disease hit the west coast and all but wiped out the 24-armed sunflower star, an important, voracious sea urchin predator. In their absence, sea urchin populations in some areas were left unchecked, and the herbivorous purple sea urchins could graze on kelp unimpeded. Around the same time, a series of marine heat waves impacted the west coast. Like heat waves on land, they involve warming conditions for an extended period of time and are accepted as a major threat to kelp forests, which favor the cooler, nutrient-rich waters. Since then, sub-52 degree days have been rare for me. I no longer wear wool socks, and I don't pee my wetsuit. <laughs> These compounding events have had dramatic and lasting effects on regions of the state. In Northern California, kelp coverage saw a 95% reduction, a loss that they're still feeling today. The diving and scientific communities recognized these changes to the kelp forests, and the race to restore kelp began. Seeing this happen before my eyes inspired me to learn more about kelp forests, and so I went on to spend the next 10 years of my life working in kelp forests. When I started this master's program, I knew I wanted to work on a project related to kelp. And so, I set out to combine my experience working in kelp forests and my passion for photography and science communication to create a multimedia resource in the form of a story map. It was aimed at increasing accessibility and understanding of the tangled kelp restoration landscape. Government agencies, scientists, nonprofits, fishermen, and ocean users had developed collaborative restoration projects to test the underlying mechanisms and overall feasibility of different restoration techniques. These projects were created to inform future restoration projects in the state. Through my story map, users can dive into the kelp forest restoration world by meeting stakeholders, learning from experts in the field, interacting with videos and maps, and exploring different regions of the state. I, for one, learn best when I can associate visuals with things, so I wanted to include interactive features for the viewer to be able to feel as though they're playing an active role in the process as they learn from these restoration experts. To do this, I traveled up the state to meet with various stakeholders in Northern, Central, and Southern California. I conducted a dozen formal and informal interviews, amassing to over six hours of interview footage, captured over 300 gigs of edited photos and videos, and logged close to three hours of time underwater on restoration sites. It was important for me to hear directly from the folks actively working in this space and to give them opportunities to describe their work in their own words. I also wanted to see the work with my own eyes and capture it in a way that audience can fully grasp the challenges and effort involved in these projects. Resulting from these regional kelp declines, a surge in interest has led to an abundance of reports and research papers. But whether trapped behind a paywall or inaccessible due to scientific jargon, these documents are not the most accessible to people, including those implementing kelp restoration uh, laws and regulations. On top of this, with so many different projects happening around the state and so many different stakeholders collaborating on projects, the restoration landscape in California is confusing, even for someone who's been working on kelp. My goal in creating the story map was to engage a wide audience from 
interested members of the public to policymakers who are looking to better understand the current efforts. Don't get me wrong, research papers and reports are still critically important um, components, but I think that we shouldn't rely solely on these to convey the importance of the work. Many times they fail to engage audiences outside of academia and fail to show the visual and social elements of the projects. Uh, at this point, I think it's important to recognize that kelp restoration isn't a new topic. In fact, scientists like Wheeler North were working on kelp forest restoration projects here at Scripps more than half a century ago. He used methods like quicklime, which is a chemical compound that killed echinoderms like sea urchins, but also had lasting impacts on the ecosystem. Uh, also, urchin smashing and kelp outplanting, which are still used today. But our oceans continue to change, and science continues to progress, and a newly inspired group of scientists have taken an interest in kelp restoration. So, using my story map, let's look at some of the restoration uh, strategies being employed. There's three main uh, categories of restoration. Artificial reefs, grazer, grazer suppression, and kelp enhancement. Artificial reefs, which utilize new or res, res, restored habitats uh, as substrates for kelp to grow on. Grazer suppression is based around the idea that reducing grazing pressure can allow kelp to reestablish itself at a given site. And kelp enhancement typically involves growing kelp in a controlled environment and outplanting it at various life stages within a restoration site. So let's dive a little bit into grazer suppression, the technique uh, used in the North Coast. So let's zoom into Casper Cove and it's in Mendocino County. This, this project is highly collaborative and involves a wide range of stakeholders and is one of only two locations in the state where recreational divers can participate in the culling of urchins. Using this interactive map feature, we can compare kelp coverage from 1989, a relatively healthy kelp year, to that of 2016, which was a relatively unhealthy kelp forest year. Um, 2016, of course, following the 2013 and 2014 sea star wasting and warm water events. So I'll skip through the next few sections of videos that discuss site selection and challenges working on the North Coast for the sake of time, but we'll watch a short film um, with Tristan McHugh of the Nature Conservancy about redu reducing urchin densities. In a report that we put together after the OPC funded project to investigate commercial diver hand harvesting of urchin in this space, we were able to reduce densities to below the targeted threshold that we were aiming for, which is understood to be two urchin per square meter. Um, so the number of two urchin per square meter is really intended to set a baseline for us, like a target of how far we should reduce grazer pressure to theoretically give the ecosystem enough space to breathe and allow kelp recovery. And that number has been tested in other places in the world. And it has, it's different for each place. And so we want to really test that assumption. And now, let's go for a dive. Let's drop below the waves and see what Casper Cove looks like underwater. So days prior to me arriving, an urchin culling event took place. So during our dive, we saw a lot of crushed urchins like the one you see here. One of the things that I really wanted to stress in this project was the difficulty in restoring kelp in these environments. These are cold, murky, surgy, inhospitable locations. And so it's easy to think of California as sunny, warm, beautiful water. Um, but the reality is that folks working in these environments are contending with a lot of challenges. And I wanted to make sure that that was clear with these photos. We can also see what an urchin barren looks like in an area that hasn't yet been targeted by recreational uh, divers culling urchins. Um, but finally, there's signs of hope. Uh, it's still early to claim any major victory. But baby Nereocystis, or bull kelp, uh, can be seen growing on several boulders within the cove. It's a positive signal that kelp spores are within the cove, and with reduced grazing pressure, kelp may make a return. Kelp restoration, the kelp restoration landscape is a still developing field um, as we continue to learn more about the efficacy of different techniques. This story map will be available and accessible online as I continue to build it out thanks to additional project funding from the Sussman Foundation. 
And with that, I'd like to thank my esteemed committee members, Drs. Teresa Talley, Aaron Satterthwaite, Patty Ahn, Ed Parnell, and Kristen Ellsmore for their time and feedback throughout the project. I was so fortunate to have such experts in the field. Um, I would also like to thank my PhD mentor, Mohamed Sadaret, the MAS MBC program staff, um, the 2023 cohort. Couldn't have done it without you guys. Um, my parents and my friends that I've gotten to know during my short time here. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions with the remaining time. Thank you. Question up top. Uh, so the question was, how do otters affect uh, urchin populations? Um, it's a bit of a hot topic. <laughs> um, but I'll say, uh, in the North Coast, you know, there haven't really been urchin popula or, sorry, uh, sea otter populations there for a while. Um, so this issue seen in the North Coast um, has less to do with otters and more to do with uh, kind of other environmental factors, including you know, the loss of uh, Pycnopodia, the sunflower star. Sorry for the pause. I wanted to make sure folks online could hear my question as well. Thank you, Keenan. Um, you mentioned a, a little bit about some of the management agencies that are funding um, and who, who are looking for information on kelp. Can you speak a little bit to um, maybe how this could help inform or any plans you might have to get this information to Ocean Protection Council, other state management agencies? Yeah, thank you for the question. So um, I actually have a slide teed up right, right for that. So um, with my Sussman, Sussman Foundation um, funding, I'll be able to work with Sea Grant um, throughout the summer. And so I'll be working closely with them um, to, to try to kind of make sure that this is a, a tool that's useful to a wide range of folks. Um, on my committee, I also had folks that are in the restoration world. Um, so representatives from Sea Grant and um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So I'm working very closely with all these you know, different stakeholders and hoping to make sure that it's not only useful to them, but to you know, kind of the wide audience, um, the general public of, of California. 